two minutes till airtime, two minutes till airtime, and one minute till streaming. We are now streaming. We are now streaming. One minute till airtime and 30 seconds till title sequence intro. Recording in progress. Thank you. We are live. Good afternoon, Durham and all of its residents and folk who are interested in watching our work session today. We would like to call the Durham City Council work session to order for this Thursday, April 7, 2020 at 1 p.m. here in City Hall Chambers, City, the Council Chambers here. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all here in attendance with us and those joining us remotely as well. Um, Madam Clerk, if you would please call the roll. Mayor O'Neill. I am present. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. I'm here. Councilmember Caballero has requested an excused absence. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Here. And Councilmember Williams has also um, requested and received an excused absence for this meeting. All right, first order of business is that we, I'm ready to entertain a motion uh, for an excused absence for Councilwoman Caballero. So moved. You didn't do it. Second. That's all good. We, we did not. It's had, it has been moved uh, by Councilwoman uh, Freeman and properly seconded by Councilwoman Johnson. Uh, are we ready um, for a voice vote this afternoon? Uh, all those uh, in favor, if you would sign by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, that motion passed unanimously. Uh, we wish her safe travels back. Now, we are now ready for any announcements that we may have by um, my our colleagues. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, honorable colleagues, everyone in the chamber, and those who may be watching, uh, wherever you are. Uh, Madam Mayor, we, we in Durham are a uh, very uh, engaged group of folk, and we might be split between whether or not we cheer for Duke or UNC, but I think there's one thing that we can all get behind here in Durham. There is a brilliant fourth grader at Bethesda Elementary School who has been invited to participate in the National Spelling Bee, the Scripps National Spelling Bee, and uh, Washington, D.C. in June. His name is Frank Dumas. Uh, I drive by Bethesda Elementary School almost every day at 10 Ward 2, not far from my home, and I can tell those kids are really special. I can see the brilliant light in their eyes, and today I just want to celebrate uh, someone we can all get behind in Durham. My money is on him to win it all in June, but whatever happens, I look forward to him uh, and his family joining us at some point where we can celebrate him and this incredible uh, accomplishment. So I just want to Madam Mayor, celebrate today young Frank Dumas, fourth grade student at Bethesda Elementary School, and congratulate him on his invitation to participate in the National Spelling Bee, something I will only ever watch on television, uh, but, we, but that's fine enough for me. So we are P-R-O-U-D proud uh, of Frank Dumas. Thank you, Madam Mayor.
Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And I think Councilwoman um, Johnson emailed this morning about this young man, and uh, we are we're going to try to do something really special uh, for him um, that when he comes back. So we look forward to seeing you, um, and you're already a winner. Yes, already a winner. So congratulations. Do we have any further announcements? All right, okay. Let us uh, then go to our first order of our business, which would be to recognize our city manager for any priority items. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the Durham City Council. <clears throat> I do have a few priority items for your consideration today. Agenda item number 11 is a resolution supporting the submittal of a merger regionalization feasibility study grant application for the Western Intake Partnership Projects. We're asking that the rules be suspended to adopt the resolution uh, during the April 7th uh, City Council work session, which is today, which will allow the city to meet an April 13th deadline to assemble and submit application materials by the May 2nd deadline for the spring 2022 grant distribution of the merger regionalization feasibility study grants under the American Rescue Plan Act's ARPA State Fiscal Recovery Fund. Secondly, agenda item number five, which is Cedar Terrace Apartments, Taft Mills Group LLC Development Loan Commitment this item is being referred back to the administration's Community Development Department. Agenda item number six, JFK Towers, JFK Towers NC, TC, LP, Development Loan Commitment. This item is being referred back to the administration, Community Development Department. And finally, agenda item number 20, which is the First Amendment to the Durham Small Business Recovery Fund Service Agreement there will be a presentation and a supplemental item has been added. That is all I have for your consideration this afternoon. Thank you, City Manager Page. You have now heard the manager's uh, priority items. Um, I am ready to entertain a motion for their approval. So moved. Second. This has been moved by Councilwoman uh, Freeman, seconded by Councilwoman Johnson, that we approve the manager's priority items. All in favor, uh, would you voice by saying aye? Aye. Aye. And the opposed will have the same option. Hearing none, the ayes have it, and the motion passes unanimously. We now will recognize our city attorney for any priority items that she may have. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Members of the City Council, the City Attorney's Office has no priority items today. Thank you, Attorney Rayburn. We now return to our City Clerk and I will recognize her for any priority items that she may have. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and City Council members. Uh, I would like to take a point of personal privilege and introduce uh, our newest Assistant Clerk and her name is Ashley Adams and I'm going to ask her to come on screen. Can you see me? All right. There she is. And um, Ashley Adams is our newest member of the city clerk staff, and she is born and raised in the city of Durham. And she is uh, a former employee of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and she brings a lot of tools to her toolkit. And we are very happy to have her on board with the city clerk's office. So I'd like to let Ashley take a few moments to um, say hello. Um, hello, everyone. Um, um, it's, I'm very happy to be here, born and raised in Durham, um, Hillside graduate, NCCU graduate. So I'm very happy to be a part of the city of Durham. Thank you. Go Hillside, go Eagles. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Ashley, I'm going to tell your family I saw you. Okay, <laughs> please do. I'll tell your mama. <laughs> All 
Madam Clerk, we, we can't hear you. We can't hear you very well. There we go. In addition to uh, my first priority item, I'd like to announce a second. Item number one, the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee appointment is being referred back to the City Clerk's Office. And agenda item number two, select applicants for the at-large council vacancy is um, requested to be pulled for discussion at the end of the meeting under other matters. And those are my priority items. Thank you, Madam Clerk. You have now heard the our clerk's priority items, and I am ready to entertain a motion for their approval. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Councilwoman Freeman and seconded by Councilwoman Johnson that we approve our city clerk's priority items. All in favor, would you say aye? Aye. Aye. All those opposed will have the same right. Hearing none, the ayes have it, and the motion passes unanimously. We will now take under consideration our uh, next order of business, which is our uh, administrative uh, consent items. Madam Mayor, excuse mm -hmm. me. Would it be appropriate now to uh, suspend the rules and vote on the manager's request to Hello. approve the resolution? Number 11, yes, I had just conferred with our attorney. She said that I could do it. Uh, add a number 11 and we could do it now. So we may do it now. Move to suspend the rules. Second. It has been moved um, by council by Mayor Pro Tem and seconded by uh, Councilwoman Freeman that we suspend the move the rules at this point in time. We will all those uh, who will be in favor, uh, would you say by saying aye? aye? Aye. All those opposed will have the same right. Hearing none, the ayes have it, and the motion passes unanimously. Move to adopt a resolution supporting submittal of a merger regionalization feasibility study grant application for the Western Intake Partnership Projects. Second. It has been moved in, uh, by Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Middleton and seconded by Councilwoman Freeman. Uh, all those in favor, would you sign by saying aye? Aye. Aye. All those opposed will have the same right. Hearing none, the ayes have it, and the motion passes unanimously. All right, just getting directions from an attorney. Oh, I like having an attorney sitting by me and see the manager. Thank y'all. <laughs> all right, now we will read our administrative consent items and all the items on the agenda to give everybody an uh, outline of what is to come and to read them for the record, purposes of the record. Number one, we have the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee appointment. And that has been, I believe, uh, uh, we will be re-advertising that. Thank you so much. Item number two has already been pulled, but that reads to select applicants for the at-large council vacancy and forward to the interview stage. And we will have a discussion, I think, at the end of the meeting today. All right. Item three, the amended Durham City County Immigrant Refugee Affairs Interlocal Agreement. Item four, 2022's short session legislative agenda. Madam Mayor, would you pull that please? Yes, sir. Item five has been referred back, which is the Cedar Trace Apartments Taft Mills Group LLC Development Loan Commitment. Item six has also been referred back, which is the JFK Towers, JFK Towers NCTC LP Development Loan Commitment. Item seven, the loss at Southside Phase Three and Phase Four Site Preparation and Environmental Assessment Contract with McCormick Baron Salazar Development. Madam Mayor, I don't want to pull these items, but I did want to take a moment to um, thank our staff and everyone who's worked on um, on getting these items um, moving and on our agenda. This is a long-awaited project that we're all really excited to see moving forward and providing um, additional affordable housing for the community in the Southside neighborhood. 
Um, it's taken uh, it's taken a while to get to this point because of economic conditions and the COVID crisis, and so we're just really glad that our, um, I just wanna thank our staff for, for pushing this forward and I'm really excited to see these buildings coming online soon. Thank you. Thank you, and I apologize, we do have um, two speakers for item seven, which will be pooled. Uh, that will be uh, for Ms. Leah Bergman and Ms. Tiffany Elder for item seven. Item eight is the loft at Southside phase three, development loan commitment that will also be pulled by Ms. Bergman and Ms. Elder. Item nine, the loss at Southside phase four development loan commitment will also be pulled by Ms. Bergman and Ms. Elder. Item 10 is the award of a construction contract to Hiram Construction Company, Inc. for the Giftons Lift Station and Force Main Project, and that will be pulled as well, I believe, mm -hmm. by Mr. Hiram. He's, he's, here. he's here as a resource. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone? No, no one's pulled. That will not be pulled. We've already concluded our actions on item 11. We now turn our attention to item 12, which is the preliminary findings, resolution, and bond order for general obligation refunding bonds. Item 13 is the intergovernmental agreement with Durham County for fire inspections and fire investigations. Item 14, the cooperative group purchase contract, one split body rear loading ref refuse truck. Number 15, the construction contract with NPS Solutions LLC for the Durham bike lane stripping, striping project NCDOT tip Number C-5605E. Item 16, construction engineering and inspections contract with Rumel, Klepper, and Call LLP for the Durham bike lane, is it striping? Striping, or stri striping project, sorry about that. <laughs> NC DOT tip number C-5605E. Item 17, the construction engineering and inspections contract with SEPI Engineering and Construction Inc. for the Durham Neighborhood Bike Boulevards Project, NCDOT, tip number C-5605I. Number 18, under the matter of beginning our public hearings is the Cedar Trace Apartments zoning map change. Item 19, the FY 2022-2023 annual action plan. Under presentations, we have item 20, First Amendment to Durham Small Business Recovery Fund Services Agreement. That will include, conclude the items that we have on our agenda. Uh, we do have a, one other speaker. He's, he's resourced. He's resourced. Oh, I didn't see. Um, Ms. Jackie Wagstaff. There is uh, not an item listed, but she would like to speak, I believe.
Okay. All right. So first we'll just go over what our pooled items are. We have item two, four, seven, eight, and nine. Is that what you have? See the manager page? That is what I Alrighty. So at this time we will um, ask Ms. Wagstaff if she would like to speak. Madam Mayor, sure. yes. Ms. Wagstaff is not in the queue. All right, thank you. We will now uh, review our pool items beginning with item number two. which reads as follows, to select applicants for the at-large council vacancy and forward to the interview stage. Madam Mayor, I believe the clerk requested that that be moved to the end to other matters for us to have a discussion. Would you prefer that? All right. Yes, Madam Mayor, would we, um, could we review that at the end of the meeting? We may. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We now then would turn to your item, um, Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, which is item number four. Thank you. Legislative, uh, 2022 short session legislative agenda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, Chief Wallace. Thank you uh, for being with us. Madam Mayor, I wanted to pull this issue uh, in part to, to make sure that it, it's demystified and, and well um, dealt with on the record for our residents and citizens, because I think it's really important initiative um, as our city uh, explores other ways to, um, one, be more efficient in terms of our, our workforce, particularly our police department, the things that they deal with and respond to, and innovative ways that comport with our values that will, uh, again, minimize their workload so they can focus on what we really need them to do and to also better serve our residents and citizens. And the use of uh, non-sworn civilian uh, crash investigators uh, is one of those things being uh, tried around the country um, that we're looking to try here in Durham to do all the things I said. So uh, Chief Waltz, if you would, and I, we've got the memo, but I do have a couple of specific questions, but just for the benefit of those watching, what is this? Could, could you tell us what this is and, and what it will look like and what it could potentially mean for the people of Durham? It is on. I think it's on, okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, members of City Council, Carmesha Wallace, City Manager's Office. And actually I think uh, we have Ryan Smith um, who's joined us via Zoom. And so I think Ryan would be the most appropriate person to um, respond to that, that question. Thank you. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, Ryan Smith, Director of the Community Safety Department. Um, so uh, Councilmember Middleton or Mayor Mayor Pro Tem, this is something not only that other cities across the country are doing, but cities right here in North Carolina are doing. Uh, and so Fayetteville and Wilmington are two that have received this type of authority from uh, the North Carolina General Assembly. And they are able to deploy uh, civilians to investigate property damage only. So let's imagine, you know, uh, something that we may have all of experience of a, a fender bender in, in a grocery store parking lot. Right now, uh, Durham would need to send law enforcement there to, com to complete a report. Uh, and what we're seeing in other cities here in North Carolina is that civilians can be trained to do this. Um, they, can, they can do this, they can often uh, get to get there faster because it's their top priority versus uh, it may not be the top priority of law enforcement who have other types of calls that they are more urgent that they respond to. They're able to reply um, or respond quickly, fill out the necessary paperwork to support uh, residents and filing claims with insurance uh, and satisfy that need. And so Fayetteville and Wilmington are each getting to about 25% of their property damage only uh, motor vehicle accidents with civilian responders. Fayetteville employs seven people to do this. Wilmington is employing two and moving towards hiring a total of six to do this work. And in Fayetteville, they said, uh, you know, in the words of one of their uh, law enforcement, that this frees up patrol to take other other uh, priority calls for service that are higher priority than traffic control. And their civilian uh, crash investigators not only are responding to property damage only, but also for some types of traffic assistance. So if a tree is down and, and traffic needs to be diverted, 
uh, these type of investigators could be deployed there. Again, freeing up law enforcement to respond to areas of higher priority and concern. So that's that's what we're looking to do. It's also what Greensboro is looking to do as well. Um, so we're part of a part of a growing group interested in this. I hope that answers your questions. No, absolutely, it absolutely does. And I think that's a really useful and important primer uh, for our residents and citizens watching who, who may have questions. Uh, this is appearing um, as a as a legislative agenda matter uh, before us, as opposed to coming from your department. Um, talk a little bit about why why we need to uh, appeal to the legislature to give us. Uh, the, the lane uh, to do this and what the timetable may look like given the uh, legislative machinations that have to occur and between that and, and actual potential deployment uh, on the streets of Durham, provided we're successful in Raleigh. Yes, sir. So currently state law requires, again, that uh, the sworn officers respond to, to these types of matters. And so Fayetteville and Wilmington have been successful uh, previously at getting basically a special authority granted by the North Carolina General Assembly so that they can do this. And they have been doing it and showing success, but it requires an order right now for other cities to do it um, or other jurisdictions in North Carolina, they each have to appeal to the General Assembly through the legislative process to get to seek this type of authority. Greensboro just uh, began this process in the last session uh, we are seeking to do this as part of the short the short session. Uh, Chief of Staff Wallace is really our expert on what the timeline would be, but the goal would be to begin this as part of the short, short session, which starts this spring, uh, and see if we can get it through then. And if not, it may carry over to the to the next session. And again, uh, Ms. Wallace could speak to more details about that. But that's why we can't just do it. It requires author authorization from the state. So thank you for that, Ryan and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. In terms of the timing, the next step in our process is um, the legislative subcommittee had a meeting uh, a couple weeks ago, which of course you're the chair of that. And so today we wanted to bring this proposal to the full city council, um, just to make sure that the full city council is aware and is in support of this uh, item, this request. If the council approves this item during your April 18th city council meeting, we will be meeting with our state delegation. And at this point, it's looking like April the 25th is the date that works best um, for the delegation and most of the members of city council. So during that discussion, uh, we'll be sharing with the delegation this one ask that, that we are making. I will say that the short session, and, and for those who are watching, the short, the short session is uh, always occurs in an odd number year. And this is where the General Assembly considers items that are non-controversial, generally speaking. Um, and so hopefully this will be viewed as a non-controversial item. And so the short session begins May the 18th. So it's important that we get the city council approval as well as approval of our state delegation. That's another key piece. The entire delegation has to be in support of a proposal that comes forward in the short session. So hopefully we can get their support. I have been in communication with some of the members of our delegation on this. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to advance it. But obviously there are some bill draft and deadlines that we are working to meet as well. But hopefully uh, when the short session begins on May 18th, we can all have support from the city council and delegation to move this, this request forward. Thank, thank you so much for that, Chief Wallace. Uh, Ryan, fin final question. Do you, um, do, do you anticipate well, first off, how many um, initial uh, FTEs or, or positions do you think you'll need? Uh, what's, your, what's your view on the initial uh, entrance into this arena, provided uh, things go well in Raleigh, which I think they will. Um, I'm count, I'm, I think they will. Uh, what do you see as the initial rollout in terms of, of person power, and will that have any potential impact on this current budget cycle? Good question. My answer is that right now it doesn't have any impact on this current budget cycle that we have moved forward our budget request without not not planning for authorization yet. And I think if if we were to get the authorization from the state, then we would need to think about uh, how to fund that work if we wanted to start it next fiscal year. But that currently is not part of our our budget request uh, today. I, you know, if this passes, um, you know, we're already working closely with DPD. We would work on putting together, I think, consistent with our other approaches, a, a pilot that would allow us maybe similar to what we're seeing in Fayetteville and Wilmington there. 
getting to about a quarter of their calls with five or six staff. And maybe, maybe my recommendation would be that we start with that type of capacity. We do have, you know, property damage only accidents account for about 9% of all resident initiated calls to 911. So there's a high volume of work there, but we would start with uh, not taking it all on, but maybe enough to get to a quarter of that to start in a pilot year. Uh, and exactly what that would mean for staffing, we have been working on the analysis of that, but we don't have a, an FTE count that we would recommend sitting here today, but uh, we would begin working on that again in collaboration with Chief Andrews and her team. Ryan, thank you so much for that, Chief Wallace. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm excited about uh, the potential impact of this initiative, particularly in the context where we, we've already uh, dealt with well-documented staffing shortages and, and, and other issues of, of just work, uh, the amount of work that we place on, on the police. And, and I'm, I'm excited, uh, Ryan, about your leadership in keeping Durham in the vanguard of, of creative um, initiatives and approaches and, and alternative approaches and initiatives as well that make us more efficient uh, as a government. Uh, that's all I have on this item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Any other questions? For me? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilwoman Johnson does have. No worries. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I didn't have a question. I just also wanted to um, appreciate the staff for getting this item forward. This is really key to the work that we're trying to do um, in the Community Safety Department to divert as much work as we can um, away from the police and to, and to community safety. And um, it's a big priority for, uh, for, for getting that work off the ground, um, being able to have civilians handle, handle these types of calls. So I'm looking forward to um, speaking with our delegation and hopefully we'll be able to see, um, see a bill to allow us to do this happening, um, happening here in the short session. And the fact that other cities in North Carolina are already doing this, I think, puts us in a really good position um, to, to be able to get that authorization and move forward. Um, this could be a real game changer for our community. So really just wanted to express my support and um, excitement that we're moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. Thank Always you. Good job. Well done. Mr. Smith, thank you as well. All right, we now turn our attention to our next pulled item, which is item number seven the loss at Southside Phase 3 and Phase 4 Site Preparation and Environmental Assessment Contract with McCormick Baron Salazar Development. And we have two uh, speakers on this matter. The first would be Ms. Leah Bergman. Ms. Bergman is here. And if you would come forth, ma'am, you will have three minutes to speak. And our staff is probably in the, in the, in the, in the zone. So they'll need to respond. Net coming items in your agenda, which some are pulled. My name is Leah Bergman. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of City Council. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My development partner, Tiffany Elder, is, via, uh, is present via Zoom. I know that all decisions regarding funding for public projects are difficult because there are always good projects not selected as part of a bid process. However, I am participating today in this work session today to specifically address the process of funding two current projects on your agenda today, and that would be JFK Towers and Cedar Trace. I sent each member here yesterday an, out, an outline of my concerns regarding the lack of transparency in the selection process for the Affordable Housing Project Awards. I am here today to answer any questions that the Council may have about the process issues raised in my letter or my team's project also described in the letter. I know that one of the primary goals of this body in approving awards for any publicly funded project is to have a process that is fair and transparent. And I am thankful that you all are reconsidering uh, these at a later date. My team has worked consistently and collaboratively with the Com Department of Community Development and its various staff members for years long before there was ever any affordable housing project um, funding. We have been pioneers in this area, putting together programs uh, to house many of the city's most vulnerable, uh, accepting, getting, accepting others to accept housing choice vouchers, and trying to bridge the gap between those that need housing and those that provide housing. It is disappointing that my team's proposal was not selected especially in light of the time that my team put in aligning our proposal with the RFP's criteria and the stated goals of the department and this city council. 
The lack of transparency in this process is an issue I believe is worth lifting up to this group today. I'm hopeful that raising this issue will promote more transparency and collaboration between private groups and public offices now and in the future. My ask for you today is simple, and I believe you all have accommodated. Um, please consider the approval of my specific project, Gear Street Residential, outlined in the letter, or alternatively, please delay the approval of the other two projects under consideration today so that all interested parties may receive additional information on the selection, criteria, methodology, and scoring employed for those proposals received. When community development has asked me to house res Durham residents over the years, that they have had trouble finding in other, via other avenues. I have always answered their call and housed them. My ask here is that, there, that we continue to work this way, that I am able to house community developments, referrals, and members of the continuum of care, and that I'm also offered... Thank you, Ms. Bergen. Thank you. And we understand that you also pool number eight, so you will have an opportunity after Ms. Elder. Ms. Elder, uh, if Ms. Elder is available, she is able to speak uh, at this time for three minutes. Are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. You may proceed. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, hello, Council. Thank you uh, for a, a few minutes of your time and for for hearing our words. Uh, just wanted to mention a, f a few quick things regarding uh, the Gear Street project. Um, uh, you know, my team, Fred Mills, Leah Bergman, and myself uh, and the team supporting us are excited. We're excited to craft a project to specifically meet the needs of our neighbors and specifically hit all of the RFP criteria quite well. Uh, just so you know, the Gear Street development uh, proposed serves the 30 to 60% AMI for all of the units. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work my team has been doing in our cities uh, and continues to do. Um, one of my partners, Fred Mills, he's built 40 developments similar to this across North Carolina, including four in Durham. He's worked with the state LIHTC office for over 30 years, and he is a leader in the field in North Carolina. Uh, and also Leah, uh, in learning more about the work that her team has been doing over the last few years specifically, that we've been working together. Um, and in learning that even some of our current housing bond funded projects um, that turned away tenants turned to Leah to house the tenants that, that were turned away, including Willard Street. Her team has, they've housed dozens of referrals that the Department of Community Develop cannot house and haven't been able to house some of them for over a year. Um, point being, um, we're here in Durham, we're doing the work, we're asking for the city support to do more our teams employ local residents and support local dollars circulating within Durham, which we rarely see with outside developers coming in, um, despite this being much needed at this point in time. Uh, the reason for our comments today, just final point, is that we have asked for feedback from uh, Department of Community Development, and we were told that feedback is, off, is potentially not available until contracts are finalized, which raised a concern. Um, and, you know, given the urgency of housing, given the demographic that needs to be served on the lower end of the AMI scale, we're just asking for more support to continue doing what we are already doing here in Durham. Thank you, Ms. Elder. Ms. Bergman, if you'd like to return to the mic to finish your comments, we will now, we understand that you pull item eight, which is the loss at Southside phase three development loan commitment, and also item nine, loss at Southside phase four development loan commitment. The two items though that you're specifically speaking about, um, which was item five and six, I believe they've been referred back, so you would have an opportunity to, to speak. Uh, to those when they come back before us, but you are certainly able to speak 
right now too as well. I, I think Tiffany did a, a wonderful job of, of summing up our, our point of being, our points of being here today. So thank you for the time. And if you all have any questions for me, I'd be happy to do my best to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Thank you, Ms. Elder. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I uh, just wanted to check in with our city manager if we could get a little detail about how this is, how the protest petition is going to be handled and how the staff is going to respond and how we can, you know, just what's the process? Council, council member, I, I missed what you said at the very beginning. It's because of the mask, but could you please repeat? Yep, sorry. Um, just wanted to ask you to give us an overview of how we are going to respond to the protest petition um, and how we can get uh, feedback from staff about some of the issues that have been raised. I don't want to ask people to respond now because I know there's a formal process. Yes, thank you for that question. <clears throat> so for every contract that we uh, intend to bring before the city council for approval, we post a notice that that is going to happen for the very purpose of others who have been involved in those processes uh, to make and make an appeal um, to have the process reviewed for technical uh, and procedural matters. And so the two items that were referred back uh, today are part of that process. And there's a time clock that begins so that that review can take place. It does not ex extend the timeline for the project award, but it does give the staff enough time to review the process so that we can be transparent with the city council about the process uh, as we are bringing recommendations uh, forward to toward them. Uh, in, in, you know, just in, in general, uh, we do receive more um, proposals than the funding that we have allows. And there is a process to try to prioritize those projects. Uh, our recommendations will be, will be coming forward uh, through the department uh, that manages it, as you have mentioned, the community uh, development um, department. And at the time that those items come forward, they will be, po they will be public just like this has been. And uh, any member of the public can have comment around uh, the recommendations that are made to city council for consideration. Thank you. All right, I believe that concludes all our pooled items. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I just wanted to follow up and just ask if there was any, any way, because I feel like the lack of transparency conversation comes up quite often and I feel like there's a lack of public engagement and and I guess whatever the process is that's happening and so similarly we're hearing the same thing on the Durham Housing Authority side and awarding I guess the Bedville Street um, location is is there any public facing side to this conversation that we're talking about with these contracts So I would respond to um, that question, you know, in, in, in a way that may, may not be completely responsive. But, you know, we certainly bring people into the process to evaluate proposals. Uh, a request for proposal process is supposed to be a process that um, is set up to allow everyone that is proposing the same opportunity to propose. Uh, there is certainly negotiation that happens after the proposals have been received and scored and, rec you know, and recommended. Uh, but in terms of engagement, you know, community engagement around the, you know, during the time of the process, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that that is something that we actually do, you know, during, you know, during the process. We want to make sure that the process is open and that the bidders have an opportunity to bring their best proposal forward. And we, you know, that is just good, you know, that's good processing, good governance. And, and I appreciate that. I think I'm specifically talking about, I guess, the review. Who's doing the review? Is that all public? So if there are 
like I know for the Durham House, and I only have the Durham Housing Authority's example mm -hmm. to, to refer from, but I know that they had people from the community involved in that review. Are we doing something similar like that, or is it all internal? Is it an internal review? And scoring, like, so once the request for proposals come in, I'm understanding that you don't want everyone talking about it all, like each and every proposal, that that's not public. But the people involved, is there some public facing piece to that? So people who are in the development community, are they sending a representative forward? People who are in, you know, the affordable housing community, are they sending a representative forward? Like, how is this process, I guess the process review set up? That's the specific issue, like so, question. So I would say, I, I would not say that every single RFP process is the exact same. Um, and I would not want to, um, you know, sit, sit here and guess as to who was on, on those selection teams as this is an active process. Uh, but we, you know, I can say in general that there are times when we have, you know, we have our internal staff, they're the ones that actually uh, set the, you know, the scope and the requirements, you know, for the, for the project that we're trying to engage in. Um, who are, you know, who are experts, but we also do uh, have in some of our RFP uh, review teams, we do have external parties, community members, you know, community experts. And, you know, you you have seen that occur as well, um, most recently in, the, in our ARPA uh, request, uh, we did have community, in, community teams surrounding, um, you know, those, those, those more, uh, creative uh, kinds of processes where we're trying to uh, make an impact in places that we don't normally, you know, always make impact. On some of our housing development or, you know, our, our public works projects and those kinds of projects that are more, you know, the, the types of projects that we engage in all the time, you will probably find less, less of that in the review process um, than you would some of our, um, you know, unique or one-time type projects. So maybe that is responsive. I hear that. Thank you. I, I do have a, uh, at least one question on, on process-wise. When it comes back before us, it would be helpful because all of this is kind of new. If we knew what, that, what exactly that process is and then specifically um, if we could know what the scoring is. I hear the term scoring, but what, what does that mean um, and how is that, how does that play out in terms of, of the RFP process? All of this is fairly new as you all to. Yes. And I would like to be, you know, cognizant about what exactly that process is and what the scoring is. It sounds like Ms. Bergman has been a partner with, um, with us for, with the community development. I think she mentioned that. Um, uh, division for a while. Is there any consideration of, of past performance um, in that process? Just what that looks like would be helpful for me. So we will make sure that at, when the staff <clears throat> is bringing forward the recommendations that they are prepared to respond to any question about about the process that you know is specific to that particular um, you know recommendation to award. Um, because they are they are different depending upon what you know what it is that we're trying to to accomplish. Okay. Thank you, City Manager Page. Appreciate that. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, um, colleagues, for I think really important questions uh, and comments. And and you know, I, f for those watching, I, I think the the ultimate um, public part of this process is us. I mean, we are the final arbiters. Uh, of the city business, and, and when the and you know we literally voted on thousands of contracts, you know, over the years, um, some um, made some of my friends happy, and some of my votes didn't make some of my friends un say made some of my friends unhappy. But I do want to affirm the 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 important work that the staff does, at least being the the gatekeepers and, and kind of the front part of this process, um, the work that they constantly do in in trying to keep the process um, full of integrity, um, uniform, um, predictable to some degree. And, and, you know, we're not always happy with 
some of the decisions they make and, and we're ecstatic with others. But I do want to, to um, lift up the important work that the staff does and, and make sure that there's a part of this that needs to be, and they're not, they're not elected officials, they're professional staffers and, and part of their process needs to be insulated. We're the ones uh, that get to ask the questions as we've done here today and I think that's an important part of the process and, and I think we'll continue um, to do that. And I think Council Member Freeman raises an important point um, but I think the fine point of that point is that, you know, when it comes before us, as we do with all other contracts, um, I think that the staff brings before us that we ask those questions and, and, and you know, do the probing that is necessary precisely because the staff has, should, and, and will continue to operate in many ways in a bubble from kind of the public kind of going back and forth and, and the lobbying. Um, and that's probably the way we want it because we're the ones that are elected. Um, so when it gets to us, um, I think it's important that we, you know, we do our due diligence and ask questions as we've done here today and we will continue to do. But I do want to commend the staff on, on the work that they've done, that they continue to do, and, and I'm sure there'll be thousands of more things that we'll vote on that, they, that come before us that, you know, members of the public will, will have questions about, and rightfully so, and will have um, issues with either yays or nays, uh, depending upon how the vote goes down. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilwoman Freeman. And thank, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I do want to make sure I do state how grateful I am that the staff is, is actually moving forward in, in allocating this bond fund and making the loans around affordable housing. I think it's important to, to appreciate that and also hold attention around the fact that in our current system, there's a lack of equity in the way that it runs. If it continues to run without guardrails that, that kind of pull out and highlight how we should be re not reinforcing what is the status quo, but actually doing something different and acknowledging who's been left out of that process, especially for black and brown businesses or women of women owned businesses. You know, it's important to, to find ways to make sure that we're finding the on ramps, even as staff, as public administrators, um, because we know that hundreds and hundreds of years have been dedicated to making sure that it runs the way that it does without interference. And we don't want to continue that. So, um, well, I don't want to continue that. And so I want to make sure that I'm clear in this process that I'm looking to see how equity is played out. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the contract goes to a person of color or a woman owned business, but I do want to make sure that they are, there are, there are elements to the way in which we've put together our RFPs that actually account for that. And so I, I don't know it. I don't have that you know, information as of yet but I do look forward to hearing back from staff around what that looks like, so I thank you. Thank you for all your comments today. Right. And we'll, we will turn now to our uh, presentations. I think that we've reviewed all our pulled items, is that correct, City Manager Page? All right. We will turn to our presentations, which is item 20, or presentation the first amendment to Durham Small Business Recovery Fund Service Agreement. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, City Council, and City Manager Page. My name is Andre Pettigrew, the Director of the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Uh, I am joined uh, uh, as a resource by Kevin Dick, CEO and president of the Carolina Small Business Development Fund, uh, who is our partner in this venture. Um, I wanna share my screen. Uh, before I, again, this is a little different. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for the icon to share my screen. Can I get a little assist in her? Okay, I see it. Thank you. The, 
the purpose of the meeting today is to give you an update uh, on the Small Business uh, Recovery Loan Fund program, a uh, program that we put in place uh, just short of a couple of years ago. Uh, one, want to sort of remind you of the, the design, uh, the structure, the eligibility requirements, uh, and we'll conclude uh, in the discussion in terms of the recommendations uh, for the first amendment to this this contract. So as I mentioned, uh, almost two years ago, we were before city council uh, uh, putting forward the framework for the Durham Small Business Recovery Fund. Again, two years ago, uh, there was a lot of stress and tension um, going about. Uh, we were like every city in the country trying to figure out how to support our small businesses as we entered into the COVID. Um, again, uh, a lot of uncertainty, something completely new. Uh, no one had any thoughts that this was gonna last for two years, uh, but city council uh, provided us the authority to sort of go back and design a program and put it together. And I, I guess I would, would say, uh, we didn't have all the details buttoned down two years ago, uh, but we did provide a strong enough outline and develop a program uh, that has been effective in our community. So the fund, uh, roughly $2.8 million, uh, was developed in a partnership uh, with uh, the city, Durham County, and Duke University. And again, I want to acknowledge the, the partnership of the county uh, who continues to be uh, in this program with us around the loan program, but special recognition going to Stephanie Williams and Duke University uh, for the million dollars that they contributed uh, because it, it was those dollars uh, that enabled the city to provide grants. Um, uh, legally, we could not provide grants through the program. Uh, Carolina Small Business Fund uh, was selected for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the city, the county, and Duke University did not have the capacity uh, to do the outreach, marketing, loan underwriting uh, in this program. Carolina Small Business Development Fund, who has been a trusted partner with the city and the county, uh, was selected one, based on their experience uh, in doing this work for a, a number of years as a, as a certified development financial institution, but also because uh, they were running uh, municipal and county programs during this period. Uh, they managed, uh, stood up and managed the uh, recovery fund for the city of Raleigh, as well as Mecklenburg County. And it was that framework that we used to create our program. Again, this was grants and loans. Uh, we had anticipated that uh, all of the funds would be exhausted uh, by uh, the end of 2020, December 31st, 2020. Uh, however, we do have loan funds available. We also knew that technical assistance was important. And again, the program that we put together uh, combined both capital and technical assistance uh, on the front end, as well as working with the businesses who secured the money. Uh, grants uh, were for businesses that were small, under a half million dollars and less in revenue, um, while loans were uh, eligible for small businesses uh, with revenue greater than a half million, but up to two million. The city funds were available to businesses that were located in the city uh, limits. Uh, which is our mandate. And while the county funds uh, were available for businesses within the county, uh, we emphasize uh, small businesses in our community, uh, less than 25 employees, but most importantly, we were looking for sole proprietors, home businesses, uh, independent contractors, and self-employed individuals uh, who, uh, again, were impacted uh, during this period. Again, we only work with the uh, locally owned and independently owned franchises in our community. And just to give you a context of that, uh, the federal program for the payroll protection plan and the emergency disaster loan program 
uh, was already in full swing, uh, but quickly uh, it was determined that small businesses, the businesses that we've targeted here, uh, were not successful. And it just happened to be that most of those businesses were uh, African-American, Hispanic, and women-owned businesses. And so we designed a program to best serve that group of uh, residents or businesses in our community. Again, talked about the revenue. Uh, you know, going into this, uh, we were looking at businesses through no fault of their own uh, were impacted by COVID. Uh, as, as you know, many businesses were operating successfully uh, in this pandemic hit and literally uh, impacted their businesses. And so uh, we were looking for businesses who had been profitable before, had a solid credit history. And again, we're operating in good standing. Um, again, uh, we weren't looking to clean up bankruptcies uh, and other sorts of financial obligations uh, that some firms had. Um, again, we were only looking to support businesses, again, impacted by COVID-19. Use of funds, uh, again, all legitimate business expenses, uh, working capital, payroll expenses uh, were, were included. Uh, in the beginning, we did not uh, allow the paying off of existing tax debts uh, and, and existing debts in general and judgments, partly because at the beginning of this, we really had no idea uh, what businesses uh, what their financial conditions were prior to COVID. And the whole parameters of the program uh, was dictated by those things that impacted businesses with the advent of COVID-19. The loan program, again, we're currently running the, the loan program. And again, with a lot of instruction from city council uh, uh, in designing this program, uh, uh, again, the loans range in the amount of five to $35,000, and it's a term loan over 10 years. Uh, it's effectively an unsecured loan in that uh, it doesn't require collateral uh, and a secondary source of repayment. Uh, it is effectively a 10 year uh, unsecured loan uh, that's based on uh, the financial projections and the ability to repay the loan. This was not a forgivable loan. This is a loan uh, that borrowers, uh, based on their revenue projections and financial information, are expected to pay it back. Again, this is a list of the standard documentation uh, that's required for the loans. Uh, again, we have relied on the expertise and experience of uh, the Carolina Small Business Fund to put together the infrastructure, the documentations and papers uh, that are required to run an effective loan program. Um, again, the city, the county, and Duke University had no experience and no abilities to put something together in, in, with the speed that we needed to respond to. Again, documentation, tax returns, uh, profit and loss statements. Again, the point here is that this uh, is a, uh, you know, detailed loan program using standard banking and underwriting practices uh, in order to assess and evaluate uh, businesses uh, for credit and for the loans. Uh, in addition to doing the underwriting, uh, uh, the agreement with Carolina Small Business Fund includes the outreach, uh, the intake, so the front end marketing of the program, uh, as well as uh, the behind the scenes evaluation and underwriting uh, and eventual loan servicing uh, of, of these, these loans that are outstanding. And again, I'll get more detail in terms of how many loans that we have out there and, and the support that Carolina Small Business Fund is providing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we combined uh, not just the money but also technical assistance. Uh, uh, and that technical assistance included assisting businesses who uh, were applying for the loans. Uh, again, the loan package and preparing financial statements and things of this nature 
uh, our requirements in order to be eligible for the loan. And it was important to the city and the county uh, that the Carolina Small Business Fund provide some upfront support to make sure that uh, folks understood what the requirements are and if they needed some assistance that was provided. Uh, in addition to the front end technical assistance, uh, Carolina Small Business Fund uh, is providing uh, technical assistance directly to the borrowers uh, as a part of their servicing uh, of the, uh, the loan uh, during this period. Uh, we're provided monthly reports uh, in terms of all of the loan amounts that have been originated, uh, the interest rates, the terms of all those loans, uh, including maturity and payments and collections. Uh, it's a comprehensive report that we get monthly uh, in, in order to inform us uh, the status of each loan. And again, I'd like to also uh, reassure you that we have done a great job of documenting our loans. Uh, we do know uh, who the borrowers are, where they are uh, located. And again, there's a comprehensive file, including information that we found uh, for applicants who may have been denied, uh, as well as information for obviously those who have been uh, successful borrowers. Again, uh, there was an opportunity for additional investors to participate. Um, again, we didn't have very many takers, but I, I will acknowledge uh, that uh, we did get a, an additional contribution from Clorox and Burt's Bees. As you know, Clorox owns Burt's Bees, uh, but they did make a contribution to support this initiative. And again, we're very uh, appreciative of that. Again, the city uh, had the rights to sort of uh, approve any additional investors uh, to the fund. Um, again, I think the thing that I wanted to note is that uh, all of the funds, the city's funds were segregated from all of the other funds. What that means is uh, the million dollars that uh, we contributed to, uh, we have tracked it. Uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, essentially uh, $800,000 of uh, the loans that have gone out have been city's funds. We roughly have a remaining $140,000 uh, as a part of the fund. Uh, and again, we remain in partnership with the county. Uh, there's roughly 900 plus thousand dollars available of which 140 of that is the city's. Again, the city's funds uh, have gone out first. Here is a um, uh, some background on the fees that we uh, paid uh, for Carolina uh, Small Business Fund to stand up and, and operate this uh, loan program. Again, uh, $200,000 uh, have been paid in terms of the creation of the fund. Uh, $100,000 for uh, our portion of the public funds for the first million, and we paid $100,000 uh, to underwrite uh, the contribution that was made by Duke. Uh, so um, roughly 10% of uh, the $2 million uh, we paid uh, uh, in advance to create the fund. Uh, technical assistance, uh, we specifically uh, uh, paid an additional $100,000 uh, to Carolina Small Business Fund for technical assistance. Uh, the purpose of this technical assistance again, was in anticipation of high demand and the need for support during the application process. Uh, and again, uh, those monies uh, were used for those purposes. Uh, and again, we feel that we uh, had a high level of efficacy in terms of working with our small women minority businesses because of investments like this, because of the outreach and experience uh, that the Carolina Small Business Fund had as part of this program. Uh, there's also uh, a, a standard uh, fee structure around the monthly servicing uh, for the loan program. Again, this is a 10 year term loan. Uh, again, we are gonna be with uh, these borrowers for a while. Uh, Carolina Small Business Fund uh, is paid a monthly servicing fee of 0.5% uh, that is calculated uh, on the outstanding 
balance of the loan portfolio. So this fee is applied against uh, the loan amount that has been distributed, uh, roughly $860,000. Again, uh, it's uh, uh, paid uh, on a monthly basis at this half percent uh, uh, rate. Uh, and again, that's roughly $4,400 in terms of the monthly servicing fee. And again, the servicing fee uh, is actually in, in, in part uh, a recognition uh, that uh, as long as these dollars are out, uh, that um, you know, Carolina Small Business Fund will be providing uh, support for the portfolio of borrowers uh, in, in this program. Again, uh, as I said, uh, we are essentially looking to be paid back. And so the loan amount is uh, a fixed 3%. Um, Carolina Small Business Fund uh, essentially retains a 0.5, a half a percent of that uh, 3%. The city receives 2.5% back uh, as a part of uh, our interest income coming back. That's roughly $4,000 being retained by Carolina Small Business Fund. Again, uh, the, the additional investors had similar structure uh, that we had, so the county uh, and uh, even uh, the uh, Clorox firm uh, paid a similar fee structure. Again, return of public funds. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are getting uh, a portion of the interest back, 2.5%. Carolina Small Business gets a half a percent. Um, we are receiving the principal payment back. Uh, and again, I think great news is that we have received uh, just over $98,000 in both principal and interest uh, uh, that has come back uh, to the city already through the program. Uh, so uh, our borrowers are essentially repaying their loans and uh, continuing to operate as a part of the program. Again, uh, we're using standard uh, uh, practices here in terms of managing the portfolio and collecting uh, the loans. Uh, again, this is a high risk environment. Uh, we know that uh, businesses have been greatly challenged as a result of COVID-19. Uh, again, our portfolio is performing uh, right now. Uh, again, there are no guarantees. Uh, but so far, so good uh, based on our collections and based on uh, the reports and the support that Carolina Small Business uh, Fund is providing. Again, there were limitations in terms of the use of the funds. Obviously, Carolina Small Business Fund uh, cannot get grants or loans. Um, uh, there, again, is a conflict of interest policy that they have to apply, uh, that they have to uh, comply with. Uh, and again, same standard for any private investors. And again, everyone has been able to adhere to that uh, standard. Uh, this is a screenshot uh, of, uh, of the current portfolio. Again, we've had 129 applicants to this program. And again, we provided some support uh, there. Uh, we actually have, uh, uh, 39 borrowers. Uh, the average loan uh, is $27,000. Uh, and the average age of the firm are 10, is 10 years old. So these aren't startups. Uh, these are essentially fairly mature small businesses who have successfully um, uh, applied and received loans from our, pro our program. Again, uh, I reported out uh, a couple of weeks ago to you uh, that 69% of our borrowers are minority-owned businesses. Uh, again, that was an important part of our goal in the program. And 49% are women-owned businesses. Uh, again, a major goal to work for the smallest firms in our community and the firms that did not have the ability uh, to be successful in the federal uh, programs. Uh, now, the next steps, um, 
again, uh, we've learned a lot uh, during the, the last 18 months. Uh, and as we've worked with the Carolina Small Business Fund, uh, the uh, First Amendment is really about uh, making some changes to the program in an effort to uh, get the loan dollars out a little, a little more quicker uh, and, and a little more uh, in a more strategic and targeted way. First of all, uh, we're proposing to change the name of the program uh, from Small Business Recovery to Small Business Opportunity Fund. Uh, it may seem like semantics, uh, but uh, again, the companies who have been able to persevere over the last 18 months are companies that essentially have been able to, one, continue to grind, uh, but they've also been able to pivot, uh, modify their business models, and, and be quite resilient and resourceful to be able to move forward. And again, the theme of Small Business Opportunity Fund, we think better captures uh, what we're trying to do as we exit COVID-19. Again, COVID-19 is still present and having an impact, but we think the name Opportunity Fund better represents what it is we're doing. Um, again, one of the major changes uh, that uh, is included in this amendment is to allow businesses uh, to uh, essentially uh, borrow against and refinance against high interest debt. Um, uh, one of the things uh, that has happened or has been observed uh, is that access to capital continues to be a challenge for black and brown businesses. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's not money out there. That means that, uh, again, caveat amator, it's important that uh, our businesses essentially know what they're getting into. Uh, there is a uh, class of predatory loans. These are high interest rates loans, loans that essentially compound almost weekly uh, uh, that has grown up. And, and these are called FinTech, financial tech loans. They're all online. Uh, they uh, essentially are aggressively marketed. Uh, and the statistics show that black and brown firms have taken on more of this debt during this period, again, because uh, they had limited access to traditional banks and traditional banking relationships. Uh, the interest on these loans are well above the 3% that we have. And so again, our analysis shows that for businesses who took out loans during this period over the last 18 uh, months uh, uh, would benefit from being able to uh, include in their loan application, the ability to pay off some of this uh, predatory loans that are part of the program, essentially taking short-term high interest debt and putting it into a 10-year term where the first year is only interest is a great way to, one, protect these companies in, in the short run, but also provide them with uh, a, a, a cash flow that enables them to reinvest more dollars uh, into inventory, into their staffing and what have you. So this is a major change. Uh, we now know the types of loans that are, these businesses have taken over the last uh, uh, 18 to 24 months. Again, uh, in the underwriting procedure, there are a number of, of things uh, that the Carolina uh, Small Business Fund uh, and their underwriters uh, have included in here that will essentially increase the process uh, for us to getting the, the number of loans out uh, a little quicker, but also gives us an opportunity to expand the average loan amount. The maximum loan is 35,000. Uh, the average loan currently is 27,000. Uh, some of the borrowers actually uh, have the credit worthiness to maybe take out a full 35,000, uh, but we were limiting uh, the, the amount of the loan to uh, three months uh, operating, uh, monthly operating expenses. And the final uh, aspect of, uh, of the program, uh, uh, again, with the adoption of the amendment, uh, is to increase the outreach uh, of our program. Again, wanting to market the program more aggressively, but also see if we can work with lending partners. 
To date, all of the loans have been just from our program. Uh, we see that there's an opportunity to maybe combine uh, our loan program with other banks, uh, other CDFIs uh, in terms of a joint lending program. Again, it mitigates the risk for the bankers. It also mitigates the risk for us, but it gives the uh, borrower an opportunity to maybe have access to a greater amount of capital beyond the 35,000 that we have. So I'm going to end uh, now uh, uh, and take any questions that you might have. Let me get out of this. Uh, portion and take questions. And again, uh, Kevin Dick is also on the phone uh, to maybe provide uh, uh, some additional details. Any questions? Mayor Pro Tem, followed by Council Member Green. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor and, and Andre. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Uh, as always, and good afternoon, brother. Brother Kevin, uh, who I understand is on the line as well. First off, I, I appreciate the um, refresher on the uh, initiative. Um, and some of us weren't on the council when when we uh, approved this initiative, so I thought the uh, the review um, on what exactly this initiative is and the nuts and bolts of it was very helpful and useful. So I'm thankful for that. Uh, and then we come, of course, to the last page, which is a matter before us, kind of the modifying. Um, the program. F first, let me say, th you know, this this was a really challenging time uh, for us as a city and, and for our business owners and for the nation. Obviously, we were in the throes of the pandemic, and he's not here. But in Councilmember Williams's absence, I wanted to celebrate uh, the role he pay played before being elected. He was one of the leading voices in our small business community, uh, pressing um, our government to be agile and responsive. Uh, to the needs of, of not only small business owners, but their workers as well, who were who were hurting uh, because of the inability to get a paycheck and, and take care of their other uh, responsibilities. So this this was a time when um, we needed to be agile, we needed to be creative, we needed to get the money out the door uh, quickly. So I just want to uh, celebrate those um, outside of City Hall who organized and, and pushed us and our partners at Duke um, and others at the county as well. Uh, in the city who, who came together to really put together what was a, a needed and timely and still needed uh, and timely uh, initiative and intervention. I did, I did have a question, Andre, about the expanded eligibility criteria. Um, and I think you may have alluded, you may have answered part of it that we're, we're actually talking about increasing the cap, I think from 27 or 28,000 to 35,000 because my understanding is we were already using standard lending practices. So when I hear expanded eligibility, well, naturally, my first thing is to think, oh, are we going to be a little more uh, flexible uh, apart from standard lending practices? But my understanding, and I think you said that we were already using standard lending practices. So when, we, when I read expanded eligibility criteria, um, is, is, it, is it appropriate for me to think that we're gonna be more flexible or are we just raising the cap? The, the limit that you can borrow. I'm going to let Kevin Dick maybe explain it from an underwriting standpoint. Okay. But again, our goal has always been uh, to get as much money in the hands of the businesses absolutely as quickly as we can. And again, uh, uh, there is some underwriting insights that uh, Carolina Small Business Fund. So Kevin, can you maybe address the councilman's uh, question? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, can everyone hear me? We can. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, thank you for your question. Um, what I would say is that the, the flexibility that we hope to gain through these amendments is, is mainly um, with the types of the, the allowable uses for funding. Um, the underwriting criteria would remain largely the same, mm -hmm. but what we want to do um, and uh, Andre alluded to it earlier, one main thing we want to do is enable, for example, borrowers to be able to um, refinance high cost debt. Um, that is a really has been a really significant problem 
throughout the course of the pandemic with some of the fintech loans going you know well in advance of 20 percent interest mm -hmm. so um the, but the underwriting criteria are are remaining largely the same you know a, a few minor tweaks but what we really want to do is increase the flexibility of use and hopefully we're thinking that that can meet the needs of more potential borrowers and we can attract more um, small businesses to the program. I hope that answers your question. No, absolutely. And, it's, and I was going to mention, I was very, I'm very excited to see the ability of business owners now to refinance some of those loans. So I, I, I took that uh, so that, so, so I guess my question is, what is the operational impact of expanded eligibility criteria, that bullet point? Is that, how do you, how do, what does it mean, expanded eligibility criteria? Um, from, from an actual impact point of view? Oh, well, I mean, it may, and hopefully it will, increase the volume of applicants. So from an operational perspective, the program could get busier that way. Um, I think one um, criterion, if not mistaken, at, at first we had a half million to two million um, as a limit, and I think we increased that to five million and which should hopefully expand the number of businesses that can participate. But we have the, the infrastructure in place, both from a technology perspective and staffing perspective to, um, to be equipped to take on the additional demand. Got you, okay. Um, and yeah, and I, I'm just slow walk with me because I, you know, we actually get questions about this, believe it or not. So when business owners ask, you know, what the criteria is, it's helpful to be able to kind of give them the elevator speech um, as to, uh, you know, what, what is, is. W with respect to expanded marketing, increased marketing outreach to include working with banks and other lending partners to promote the fund to their bank clients, that we're not looking for them to actually um, add money to the pool. Is, is, is it appropriate to interpret this as they may not be able to get money from them, but hey, you might want to check out this city initiative since we can't help you? Is, is that... Stop. Yeah, I'm sorry. Spot on with your second. And yes, your, the, the second interpretation was exactly accurate. Okay. Um, we, we know that, um, as Andre mentioned, historically um, underserved groups, businesses owned by people of color, women owned businesses, um, those who identify as being low to moderate income, LGBTQ, all of those types of groups have had um, They've lacked access to capital from traditional institutions. That doesn't stop them from pursuing access to capital with these institutions. And sometimes uh, for banks, you know, their underwriting criteria or their credit box just don't match some of the clientele who have applied for loans through this program. And so what we're hoping to do is really utilize this program as a referral mechanism that will help our banking partners be able to have an, an, uh, an additional resource and obviously help the potential um, borrower or that small business that cannot access capital from the traditional financial institution and can instead um, receive capital through the Durham Small Business Recovery Fund. Got it. Thank you so much. I think the rebranding is a, is a good thing. And again, I, I, am, I am beyond delighted that these, uh, these business owners will now be able to refinance uh, some of these high interest loans using, using this money. Um, so good work. I'm, 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 I'm grateful for the, uh, for the um, amendments, the pro proposed amendments. I look forward to supporting them. And thank you for answering my questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilwoman Freeman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just had two questions. And just following up, I do want to appreciate the amendments and the expansion. I, I just wanted to ask if these funds, once they are received in, I noticed you mentioned that we are receiving payments. So that 98,000, will it be loaned back out? Thank you for that question, uh, uh, Councilman, uh, Council Member uh, Freeman. Um, currently as organized, the, mon the monies are being returned to the general fund. So the, this, um, we, this is not a revolving loan fund that was not uh, what was set up. Uh, again, uh, we are essentially uh, paying back to the city uh, the monies that uh, it contributed into this program. 
And then, thank you, I appreciate that. I just wanted to know for clarification. And then just, um, just I guess in reference to, to uh, Carolina Small Business, I just want to know if you're maximizing the opportunity to find matching funds around this work. So, um, Council Member Freeman, I'll take that question. We, we, have, um, we have gotten a, a donation from Clorox. Um, you know, at this point, it's quite honestly with, um, you know, sort of waiting on the criteria, the, the updated criteria to be approved, we haven't necessarily seen the demand that would necessitate really trying to attract a lot more private capital. The last thing we want is for there to be um, too much, so much capital and, and under, you know, under demand for it. So at this point, um, you know, we, we've really seen, uh, we've seen a situation in which the approved applicants, um, you know, have not um, reached the, the amount of, of city funding and um, we have not uh, spent any of the county money yet. So a lack of capital is not necessarily an imminent issue, but I, I do believe that the relationships in the marketplace um, will make it possible to attract uh, more capital to the fund um, when and if necessary. Thank you. That was all. Thank you, Mr. Pettigrew, for your presentation today. And thank you, Mr. Dix, for being here. Thank you, Thank you for the opportunity. All right, I believe that concludes our presentation. I do wanna just note that um, I'm not sure what our current interest rate looks like in our general fund, but I think that the 2.5% that we're earning in these repayments in our general fund is above where, where we would be at if the funds were just sitting. And I just wanted to just note that, that was all. Any further discussion on that item? All right. We now turn to our next sort of business, which would be to settle our agenda. And then we have other matters after that. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor and <clears throat> Ms. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. I have for your agenda, city council meeting, consent items three and four items seven through 10, and items 12 through 17, uh, GBA public hearings, items 18 and 19. Thank you, I am ready to entertain a motion. Just move we approve the agenda. Second. Been moved by Councilwoman Johnson and seconded by Councilwoman Freeman uh, to settle our agenda uh, if we would Signed by saying aye. 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 And those have the same right. Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. And I believe now we will turn to our clerk for other matters. Good afternoon, Madam I'll Mayor. Uh, I have spoken with um, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, and I think he's prepared to, to give you an update on the at-large vacancy process. M Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Madam Mayor, with your permission. we. Um, uh, so per our actions on Monday night, we decided not to submit our um, recommendations or votes for uh, candidates to advance in our selection process to fill uh, the vacant at-large seat. This was in deference to Councilmember Caballero's uh, inability to participate with us, and obviously Councilmember, Councilmember Williams isn't here as well. Uh, what the clerk and I discussed was uh, doing what we were going to do today at our next work session, which would be Thursday the 21st, which would still put us uh, in a position to meet the other dates of, of interview and um, wh whatever the timeline is, it would do no violence uh, to the timeline as it exists. We would just be doing our initial um, cut, if you will, or, or recommendation for advancement at the 21st. I do, uh, and Madam uh, Attorney, you might want to weigh into this. I've already uh, received a um, excuse absence for that work session. However, an electronic ballot is being um, 
um, distributed to council members prior to that meeting date. My intention is to submit my uh, selections prior to that as we do with um, uh, uh, nominations and appointments. I don't know if they become legal until the actual time at the uh, of the meeting date, but my intention was to, to submit my uh, selections to be tabulated on that day. If it's not, that should in no way impede the council from, from moving forward. I'm not asking that the council not do it on that day, but I just wanted to, for the record, uh, express my intent to vote. I just won't be there that day. Um, so that's, that's our proposal that, uh, colleagues, that we go ahead and do it on the 21st, what we were going to do today, and still continue with the dates as, as uh, currently set forth in the timetable. Thumbs up, everybody. All right, that sells it. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Right. I would like at this time to offer our congratulations to our new Supreme Court Justice. Here, here. And a public defender at that. You go, girl. <laughs> yes, you go. Yes, past time. All right, unless there's anything else that would claim our attention today, we are now adjourned. Right. We'll see the strong. We'll see the strong.